Welcome to the Heroes of the Storm Deep Dive Panel. Your panelists are Matt Cooper, Phil Gonzalez, Richard Koo, Brian Sousa, and Alex Sun. Hey everyone, welcome to the Heroes of the Storm Deep Dive Panel. Thank you all for coming. We're really excited to show you some of the heroes and battlegrounds in our game. And here to, to show this stuff off, we have from the art side, Brian Souza. Hello. <laughs> Got a lot of fans. <laughs> Bill Gonzalez. Hey, guys. And from the design side, you have me, Alex Sun. <laughs> Thank you. Matt Cooper. Hey, guys. <laughs> And the man who's going to start us off, Richard Koo. Yellow BlizzCon. <laughs> All right, so just by a quick show of hands, can, I, can you guys raise your hands if you've gotten a chance to play Heroes of the Storm? All right, all right. That's awesome. So let me start with a little story. For the past 22 years, we as developers, like you players, have developed deep connection with our universes and all of the heroes. We've immersed ourselves with all the games, and we're really inspired by the work that we've done, not only as our own dev team, but by other dev teams. So we thought it would be cool to build a game that actually features all the heroes in Heroes of the Storm coming together in a big team brawler. You know, we're kind of like you know, a kid in an ice cream store getting like the perfect ice cream sundae. You know, we got a scoop of chocolate, you got a scoop of vanilla, you got a scoop of, you know, you put a banana on top, whipped cream, the cherry on top, and then you slap a hamburger on that. You know what I mean? Like, we really wanted to give ourselves a lot of freedom to build sort of the game that we want. This creative freedom is really liberating, and any cool idea that we can think of, we want to try and jam pack it into this game. So that's why you're going to see heroes like Arthas the Lich King fighting off with, like, Raynor, the renegade commander, and fighting the Lord of Terror, him slash herself, uh, Diablo. So with this basic premise in mind, with the universes colliding, the first question we had to ask was, well, where is this fighting taking place? And to answer that question, I'm going to hand it over to Phil. I'm going to talk now. <laughs> so bringing these three universes together, the one thing that it creates is a ton of possibilities. And we thought, well, what do we want in the Nexus? And the immediate thing that comes to mind is many, many, many heroes using signature abilities, iconic heroes, and most of all, since it's a brawler, they need to be able to look like they belong together. So we're taking a little bit of each artistic style. We use the big, bold shapes and colors from World of Warcraft. We use that kind of attention to detail and that functionality from Diablo 3, and we spin it all together with the grittiness from StarCraft 2. That's the visual style we're going for in Heroes. So taking that into account, we're like, awesome. They look like they belong together. Where are we going to put these heroes? We thought, you know, we could put it in an established universe, something from World of Warcraft or maybe Sanctuary or even a place from StarCraft. But the more we thought about it, the more we wanted that creative freedom to just take it anywhere. Put the heroes and the players in a new place that they can experience for the first time and see iconic stuff and learn about a whole new game type. That was our goal. Brian's going to explain a little bit more about the steps we took. So yeah, <clears throat> you, all know, you all know the heroes of um, Heroes of the Storm, but we wanted to give you something new. So we started thinking about where else could we go? We were all brought up with the works of Tolkien and George R. R. Martin and Robert Jordan, and of course playing Dungeons and Dragons. And so for us, fantasy is still a first love. But you know we already have a fantasy world, so how do we change this? Well, with King's Crest, we went in a more classical, neutral setting. This is the kind of thing you would see in a storybook like Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty. And with these concepts, we, we've decided to make it a you know, more pretty world, more beautiful, more green, luscious. And see, these are, <clears throat> sorry. these are some of those concepts as you'll see them in the games. But we just don't always rush to final artwork. We have to decide, will it work in this battleground? How will it feel? to play around all of this medieval setting. And so we make these mock-ups. And this really helps us come up with new ideas and sell the ones we have. For instance, these doodads are not just aesthetic. These are actual gameplay um, objectives, such as the towers and the stone dragon. 
the stone dragon was one of our first concepts, and it actually made it into the final game. And this is it as it animates when your town is preparing for battle. Next is a flyover of the gardens, as you'll see it. This is, we deemed this Dragonshire. And we wanted a really clean, beautiful place to kill your enemies in. It's got, you know, pristine hedges. It's got topiaries. Um, if you've played, you, you know, the main objective here is um, bringing the Dragon Knight alive. And so there he is in the center of the map. And so this is basically how our first take on King's Crest turned out to be. But not all of our artwork makes it into the game. And here's Phil to tell you about that. So initially in Heroes, we had goblins as the racial merchants and ogres as the brutes. They're going to be featured on every map, regardless of what universe the map took place in. The more we thought about it and the more we tried to experiment with things like these ogres being wearing, ugh, excuse me, wearing King's Crest uniforms, the more we kind of wanted to do something new and something unique. We also took this approach with the minions. We didn't want to be bound to footmen from the World of Warcraft universe because it'd seem odd if you have an alliance character like Valen chopping up footmen all the time. It just would kind of interfere with the experience out the gate. So we went and took this new approach. We're having new minions, new wizards. We even have characters that are themed to their tile sets. And you're going to see a lot of stuff that shows off these themes. This is what the aesthetics look like on the basic buildings. You can see that we have vines crawling all over the buildings and that the dragon motif gets carried through on top of the towers and in front of the catapult. Matt's going to explain a little bit more about the base. Yeah, so in Heroes of the Storm, we've added fortifications. So here we have a really powerful Diablo. He's just, he's just going to mow down these minion waves. Uther is going to go out and challenge Diablo a little bit. But this is not looking good. So Uther can run back through his gate and Diablo cannot chase him. Uther's able to use his healing fountain to heal up for a bunch of health and mana and go out and challenge Diablo again. So being close to your fortification is a huge defender's advantage. Oops, I'm sorry. Back it up. All right, so here are the siege giants, and these are what replaced the ogres. The siege giants essentially have the same aesthetic as the ogres, but they're visually very, very different. They're big lumbering brutes, they're about as smart as a house cat, and they get themed to their, right, their location just like everything else. You can see we have a concept here of all the night heraldry that they wear. Matt's going to explain how the siege giants work. So siege giants are a standard mercenary we have across all battlegrounds. The siege giants are something that when you capture them, they'll be in awe of your strength and they'll actually join your forces. They're pretty easy to capture. We see Muradin clear them up pretty quickly. And now they're going to actually join Muradin's forces. They have long range attacks, so they're great at killing forts early on. So we have several different types of minions that you can capture aside from the siege giants. Another type are the knights. The knights are extremely powerful, and like all the other characters, they will be themed to their locations. The maps on the gardens wear white armor, and they have a rose motif. Matt's going to show you how the knights work. Yeah, so the knights are a lot more challenging to, cap to capture. So you see, we, we see here three players attempting to capture the knights, and they work similar to the siege giants. When you defeat them, they will join your forces. The knights are strong melee bruisers, so they're great at going into the front lines of combat and soaking up a lot of damage. And finally, another unique minion is the boss monsters. And the boss monsters vary from map to map. Sometimes they're very, very closely tied into the map mechanics, and other times they're just super minions. On the gardens in King's Crest, we have the Dragon Knight, which Matt can explain more. Yeah, so this is a look of Dragonshire, one of the maps we have playable here at BlizzCon. If you control a top capture point and a bottom capture point on this battleground, you can come to the center and channel on this Dragon Knight. So we see here Stitches and Nubrak and Arthas. Arthas is going to come in and channel on the Dragon Knight. And when you enter the Dragon Knight, you get a whole new set of really powerful abilities. These abilities force a team fight. The enemies have to deal with you. And we can see Stitches is pretty excited. He's dancing a little bit there. but. So eventually, King's Crest grew to be a huge, immersive world. And there's way too much to put on one battleground. Can I get this? Thank you. You're welcome. So we, we decided to look at different areas of which we liked and expand upon them. 
the docks area really appealed to a lot of us for dirty pirates, you know, drunkards. Just the, the aesthetic just really excited us. So Black Hearts Bay was born. And then we went back to the drawing board. We concepted ships and cannons and statues to dock posts and crab barrels. Everything had to have a, a same similar feel to make sure it fits with the docks. Everything here is an actual doodad or prop on the map. From small to large, it helps really give it the uh, immersive, immersiveness that we look for. So let me explain a little bit more about how we launched into developing Blackheart Bay. As Brian said, we had a lot of elements on one tile set, and the ship was a key factor into making a distinction for a new map. The ship created a lot of possibilities for us. The designers were questioning things like, what if you could take over the ship and it would bombard enemy towers and lanes? So we put the ship on the side of the map, and it turned out to be a really fun feature. But we thought, man, the side of the map doesn't really get people focused on the ship. We should put it in the center. But that created a new problem. How do we sail this ship into the center of the map? This is our solution. So we have ghost pirates. Ghosts are awesome. Ghosts can travel anywhere. And because they're pirates, they never stop loving gold. All it takes is a deep, deep love for money, and your soul will stay in the mortal realm. Ghost pirates ended up being a very strong thematic drive on Blackheart's Bay. And we're going to look at some of these map mechanics a little closer to show you how they work. But ah, Zeus is going to talk. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is a flyover of what we have for Blackheart's Bay right now. And as you can see, it still has the King's Crest feel at the core, but with the added docks and the wood, it really changes the aesthetic look of this um, battleground. And also, having unique um, centerpieces, such as the ghost ship itself, really adds a deeper lore to the King's Crest, um, you know, world. The mythology. <laughs> mythology. Thank you. Would you like to talk? So. Now we have this really cool uh, fantasy of ghost pirates and Black Hearts Bay. So we wanted to design a mechanic that ties the fantasy together and gets players to interact with Blackheart himself. To that end, you know, as we all know, pirates love treasure. I hear in certain other worlds that, you know, pirates have been known to parlay for extra gold, if you get my drift, you know? So anyway, we're going to have treasure spawn throughout the map, and players are going to collect it. Once they've collected enough treasure, they need to actually go and turn it into Blackheart himself. However, there's only one Blackheart on the map. So when players are actually going to turn in Blackheart, they have to be very careful. Because if you're killed, you actually drop all your treasure, allowing the enemy players to scoop up all your treasure and claim it for their own. Here we see Illidan taking out one of the many pirate mercs that are, are appear on Blackheart's Bay. These guys are very easy to kill, and they serve as a constant source of doubloons for the players. Another source are these chests. As you see here, they actually spawn in the middle of the lanes, and they're a little bit more contested. Illidan and Tassadar need to put in a little bit more effort to get all of the treasure out of this chest, but as you can see, it's a lot more than normal. So whenever these spawn, you need to go and get them. As I mentioned before, when you go turn in the treasure to Blackheart, you gotta be careful, because when you have enough treasure, it's almost like you become the quarterback. You know, the entire team wants to protect you, make sure you can safely deliver the payload to Blackheart. But the enemy team, they want to sack the crap out of you and steal all the treasure for themselves. So here we see a treasure-filled Abathur crawl into Blackheart. Unbeknownst to him, Scumbag Diablo and Scumbag Nova come out and gank him. Oh man, that's so many coins. Now Diablo and Nova have all of the treasure, and this villainous duo can actually go and turn it in and claim Blackheart for himself. But good guy, uh, good guy Tassadar and good guy Illidan come in and reclaim the treasure for themselves. A lot of this chaos and drama we think is really exciting. With the treasure changing hands a lot, players need to think on the fly, figure out who has the most treasure, who can they protect, how many, coin, how many treasures have each team turned in. And so here we see Tassadar actually turning in the treasure, and he's going to actually win Blackheart's favor for a short period of time. Blackheart's ship will bombard the enemy from the center of the map. As you can see, the cannons will fire. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So then across the map, you can see the cannonballs land and hit enemy forts from anywhere on the map, doing terrible, terrible damage. 
You know, during this time, like the damage cannot be prevented. The enemy team just has to take it. And during this time, the players that have actually summoned Blackheart should regroup. So start thinking about how to gather more treasure, or think about turning in to Blackheart any coins that they have left over from the last time they turned in. And that's Blackheart's Bay. So here's a closer look at the theme on all the buildings and the bay stuff in Blackheart's Bay. You can see the towers and walls are dock themed, and we have a hippocampus capping the towers and the other base armaments of the catapult. We also themed out the Siege Giants. Instead of throwing rocks, they shoot cannons. We love doing this stuff. It makes it way more immersive. Yeah, and the Siege Giants are the same mercenaries we talked about earlier. They, they work in the same way. So here we see Gazlo laying down some turrets and attacking these Siege Giants. And when he defeats them, they're going to join his forces. His buddy ETC can jump in with his global ability, finish off the Siege Giants, and they cower. And now they're going to join their forces and make a push. So that... That's a lot of fun to take something and always change it thematically for each map. Here are what the knights look like on this map. They have a really, really strong nautical theme. They might not even be people. There's tentacles coming out of their helmets. They're some kind of weird Octodad kind of guys. Anyways, they still take coordination to kill, and they have huge anchors and stuff to beat the heck out of your enemies once they join your side. Next, we're going to take a look at the boss monster on Blackheart's Bay. Yeah, so this is the Grave Golem, and he's kind of like a really big knight. You need your whole team to defeat him. So here we have a group of five players coming in, and they're going to fight the Grave Golem. And he has some WoW-style boss powers where you have to try and dodge them for maximum efficiency. Similar to our other mercenaries, when you capture him, he will join your forces, and he kind of forces a team fight as the enemy players have to come deal with him. So Cursed Hollow... Oh. No, no. Artist, artist not time. you. Artist time. I'm next. Whoops, whoops, whoops. So we weren't finished with King's Crest just yet. We wanted to see what the outlying countryside might look like. Out here where the King's Law was barely a whisper, the Raven Lord set up his domain. And of course, more concepts were drawn up. Most of these we focused on like the fall harvest and a huge raven motif. The, the colors themselves give this whole map, this whole battleground, a different feel. It's very spooky, it's very somber, and of course, perfect place for the, the, uh, the knights and the um, grave golems to live. This map also has a unique um, objective to it, and Ku here will be talking about that. But I'm going to pass that privilege over to my buddy Matt. <laughs> Knew it! So now I'm actually going to talk about Cursed Hollow. <laughs> So with Cursed Hollow, we wanted to create a battleground that encouraged early team fights. We wanted to pull players out of lanes early on, but we didn't want to keep them out of lanes for too long. So we came up with this idea of tributes. And when a tribute spawns, it spawns in a random location on the battleground. And players have to come out and channel on this tribute to collect it. And if you gather three tributes, you give your team a map-wide power play. The enemy minions are significantly weaker, and their forts don't even fight back. And of course, as I mentioned, because these tributes spawn in random locations, there's different strategy depending on where they spawn. So if they spawn near a friendly watchtower, you might not have to send your whole team to fight over it. But if it spawns deep in enemy territory, you might have to give it up or do a big team push to try and secure it. So this is a pretty standard three on two in the bottom lane on Cursed Hollow. We see players are kind of skirmishing, but a tribute is going to spawn soon. So players are going to have to leave the lanes. Now, the tribute is spawning pretty close to this lane, so it kind of makes sense that all five of these players are going to go contest this tribute. But we're also having Stitches come in from, from another lane to try and help out his team. So as the tribute spawns in, a player has to channel on the tribute to collect it. But you can't just ninja the tribute. You actually have to control the area because damage prevents the channel. So we see the team fight's going to continue, and it looks like the red team has kind of pushed them back, and they're going to attempt to channel on the tribute again. But channeling on the tribute actually takes quite a while. So the blue team's able to come back in and force the fight. And we'll notice not all 10 players are fighting at this tribute. There are still players in other parts of the battleground pushing lanes or taking objectives. And it looks like Tyrio and Tassadar were able to clean up. Tassadar is now going to channel on the tribute. And Tyrio is actually going to stay nearby Tassadar to make sure that they're actually able to secure this tribute and no more team fighting occurs. 
So when you gather three tributes, that's when you actually summon the curse. So this team with Uther have two tributes right now, and Uther is going to collect the third tribute. Now Uther is traditionally a pretty low damage hero. He can't normally kill minions or structures too quickly, but because of the curse, his damage is basically amplified against the minions and structures. So we see with a single Holy Radiance, he's just able to annihilate the minion wave. And we're, we're cheating a little bit here. The structures would not normally die that quickly, but they don't fight back. And Stitches is outnumbered. He's against a level 95 Uther, so he goes down pretty quickly. And we see here the towers don't actually shoot back at Uther because of the curse. So the enemy team is basically forced to fight fires all over the map. So let's take a look one more time at this creative freedom I've been talking about. Once again, we've applied the Raven Lord aesthetics to everything on the map, like the front of the catapults and towers having Raven motifs, and the walls and towers being kind of more decrepit and crumbly and wrought iron. We really, really like doing this, and the thing we like the most is it gives us the creative freedom not to be bound to things like ogres or goatmen or things from other universes. Yeah, we can do those in specifically themed maps, but as a general rule of thumb, this is a very universal, iconic character that will always be understood no matter what tile set you're on, and they always will work the same way. You just see slight variations. So here are the variations for the knights, and these guys are just super hardcore black knights waiting in the forest, and they have their shrines, but because they're iconic and we always know what they look like, we know we're going to need teamwork to defeat them, and that once they're defeated, they'll join our forces and be a really awesome pushing power. Okay, we have one more battleground out there right now. It's called the Haunted Mines. And this one takes heavily from the Cursed Hollow tile set, so you'll see a lot of similar things. But we also themed it for the mines themselves, so we created mine tracks and the mines and um, just smaller details, and it really gives this battleground a different feel. But the main difference for this battleground is the mines themselves. All right, so the idea behind the Haunted Mines Battleground is that we wanted to create a competitive dungeon where players are actually racing against PvE mobs to construct this Grave Golem that you sort of see in this loading screen. You know, it's a race for the skulls, and players have to figure out how they're going to divide their team to collect skulls versus fighting the enemy team who's also trying to collect skulls too. You know, when we first decided to make this map, like, um, I thought we were kind of crazy. I was like, guys, are we actually going to make a multi-layered map on a single battleground that has two different tile sets and whatever? And heck, I was proven wrong. And this is the kind of example where if you push the... Whoa. Hello? Oh, okay. When, we, when you really push the tech, art, and design, you create an experience like no other that's really unique and extremely exciting. So here you see Raynor, Kerrigan, and Zagara. They're just laning normally. They're fighting off the minions. But soon the Raven Lord is going to call and say that the Haunted Mines are open. So when the Haunted Mines open, you just need to right click on the mine shaft to go down below. And you can kind of see some of our cool tech in action. You can actually see Kerrigan and Zagara appear below. And as Raynor actually right clicks on the shaft, he's going to be teleported into the mines. Now, the mines are big, dark, and scary, and there's a lot of paths. As I was saying earlier, players have two, two main strategies, spread out or stick together. When you spread out, you can actually cover more ground. You can see you can kill these skeletons pretty fast and collect a lot of skulls. But the advantage of sticking together is that you're much stronger if an enemy team comes and fights you. Obviously, if the enemy team kills you, they're going to be able to claim all the skulls for themselves. There are certain heroes that are better at clearing out skulls, and there are certain heroes that are better at fighting heroes. At the end of every Haunted Mines, there's actually a Grave Golem, and he actually has a significant number of skulls, so oftentimes, oftentimes players are going to be seen fighting this guy at the same time. He takes some time to uh, actually kill as well. Here you see Kerrigan actually fighting the Grave Golem herself. Now, Kerrigan's a really strong 1v1 hero, so she could actually probably take it out, but because she's by herself and the enemy team sort of senses blood, Anubarak and Taranda are actually going to come in and kill Kerrigan before she's able to get all the skulls. I think if Kerrigan could mulligan this, I think she would bring more allies, you know what I'm saying? So once, you, once all the skulls have been collected, a Grave Golem will actually spawn in the player's base. Now the first time that you finish this event, they'll respawn there so that players can actually hearth back and start to figure out, like, are we going to push with the Grave Golem, or are we going to defend against the enemy? 
The Grave Golem is really powerful, and he'll actually ignore minions and heroes and just honey badger down and destroy the enemy forts. However, as I was saying, you know, the number of skulls that you collect is really important because it directly affects how strong the Grave Golems are here. So while this Grave Golem did some damage, he's actually going to die. But if you have a lot of skulls, your Grave Golem gets big and mighty. As you can see here, I mean, you can see the artist went kind of crazy with this. He's got like rock armor, skull, blue things. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just know that he's awesome and he's more powerful than the other Grave Golem. You know, and so here we have uh, um, Kerrigan, Zagara. They're actually pushing with the Grave Golem. And that's really, really important because the next time when the Grave Golem respawns, he'll respawn from the last place that he died. It further incentivizes the players to push with their stronger Grave Golem, and it forces the enemy team to defend against the Grave Golem, because like I said, he's just going to keep honey badgering down these lanes, and he's, he just doesn't care. He's just going to destroy that enemy palace. If he's left unchecked, he'll just end the game. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. So, you've seen how the artists and designers work together to create these games. I did. But this I want <laughs> This is some design art for us. Um, but I wanted to show you a quick video of exactly from start to finish how we would actually populate a battleground. This is just a concept, um, and it won't be anything you see in the game. I, I made this exclusively for BlizzCon. So, you know. So here we go. We start with a blank map. This is sped up a little bit. And we paint down the textures. As you can see, I, I laid out different areas of what I saw on the original ideas. After I have the textures down, I start placing all of the props and doodads. And with our editor, we have, we have choice of hundreds or thousands of doodads that we have made. And we can place them anywhere we want. We can rotate them in any direction. We can scale them up or down. We can tint their colors if we want to make different looking trees. So the editor is very powerful. So once the larger areas are defined, I start going in with smaller details to give it a little more life. You know, the, Smoke in the chimneys, the guys hanging around, working, floor mats and flowers. All of this really brings this area alive. And as you can see here with the final look, this is what it would look like in a battleground. And it didn't take like 20 seconds. It was awesome. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about how we design our battlegrounds. Let's go into a little bit of detail on how we design our heroes. So you may have heard this from other panels, and this is one of the core design philosophy values that we actually uh, follow. What is the fantasy? And for Heroes of the Storm, it couldn't be more important. What is the fantasy really speaks to, when you think about playing these heroes, what do you imagine them doing? What is the universe that they're in actually like? What kind of powers have they used in the games? What kind of cinematics have you seen them do things? Like, when I look at Rainer, I think about how he's a Marine, in, he's a Terran in a Marine suit, and he uses a big gun, and he calls in Banshees and Hyperions. When you look at Arthas, you see him summoning Sindragosa. He's got a legion of undead. All this cool stuff. An extension of that idea is what makes this character unique. Just like, all of, just like how all of our fantasies for the heroes are unique, we want their play styles to be very different. So when you look at Kerrigan, I think about how her wings are really give her a really unique sort of silhouette. I also think about how vicious she was in the Heart of the Swarm cinematics and how she like just tears people apart. I look at Diablo and I think, man, this guy is really big. He's going to knock people over. He's going to breathe fire on people. He's going to just burning ate the countryside. And then I look at a hero like uh, Tyrael, and you know, he's a, he's a warrior, he's an angel, he's probably pretty tough to kill. What kind of things can he do? I also, I also think about how like, the cursed angels in uh, Act 4 of Diablo 3 were moving around like lightning fast. And that's what I think of when I think of Tyrael, at least. The next question we ask, who is this hero for? How difficult are these heroes? So on the left side, we have Raynor. And you know, he's a... He's a He's intended to be a beginner hero. He's actually going to be our main hero for uh, the tutorial. He's a very warm and inspiring kind of guy. I bet, uh, you know, I, I would like to have a drink with him, you know, share a couple stories. He's a pretty chill dude. And then on the right side, we have this monstrosity gene weaver, Abathur. And, you know, he's kind of like, his, his kit is meant for experts of these kind of genre. You know, like, we always like to say that our game is easy to learn, difficult to master. But Abathur is actually... Extremely difficult to learn, extremely, extremely difficult to master. You know, a lot of his abilities are like are strategic. I mean, his basic ability, Symbiote, is map wide. And he's got to spend his whole time scanning around, around the map and really supporting his allies. 
The final thing we think of is what's the hero's role on the battlefield? So on the left you see Vala, and her playstyle is, uh, is designed after the Demon Hunter in Diablo 3. She's going to vault in and out of combat aggressively and do a lot of damage to her enemies with her bow attacks. And then on the right, we have a hero like Tyrio. Tyrio is a warrior, and he's really hard to kill. He uh, soaks in a lot of damage, and he slowly wears down his enemies. In addition, as part of his fantasy kit, he's a protectorate. He will actually use abilities that will defend his allies. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the fantasy behind our heroes and kick off some of these closer looks. We're going to start with Stitches. And Stitches is one of the oldest heroes we have in Heroes. We started off with him a long time ago because there's so many cool little factors. He's got asymmetry all over the place. His limbs aren't even the same length on either side. Lots of animation possibilities, lots of effect possibilities. And here's a look at the iterations we did getting him into the game. So the Undead Abomination originally showed up in Warcraft 3, and it had a ton of personality. It was very iconic, and it naturally made the transition into WoW, which is where Stitches comes from. He stalks Darkshire. He was a really cool quest objective, and we thought he's a perfect candidate to get put into Heroes. This is the first version of the model that we saw two years ago, and as we've continued development, we have upgraded almost all the art that you saw back then. This is what he looks like now. We've put a lot of energy and effort into making much better animations, much better effects, and overall improving every hero you're going to see. So Stitch is a warrior, and in Heroes of the Storm, he has abilities that let him pull enemies into his team. And he, he has abilities that make him very difficult to kill, but he's also great at setting up his team. So we're looking at a screenshot here of Stitches hiding behind some trees, and Arthas is unaware that Stitches is there. So Stitches can use his signature ability hook to pull Arthas in and to start a fight. So here we have Stitches landing the hook and pulling Arthas in. And Arthas and Stitches are going to brawl for a little while. And Stitches has an ability called Devour, which he can use to do a lot of damage and heal himself. After he lands that ability, Arthas has to run away, but Stitches is able to secure the kill with his slam ability. In Heroes of the Storm, we let players choose which heroic ability they're going to bring into combat, but also how to augment their basic abilities. One of Stitches' heroic abilities is Putrid Bile, and this basically spreads goop all around the battleground as Stitches moves around, does a lot of damage, and slows heroes. So we're going to take a look at what that looks like in action. We have a little two-on-two -two skirmish with Gazlo and Vala against a Stitches and a Falstad. Stitches lands his hook, pulling them in, and normally these heroes could run away from Stitches, but as soon as he starts using his Putrid Bile and moves around, they have to stay and fight, and the Stitches and the Falstad are easily able to clear up this fight. As I mentioned previously, you can augment your basic abilities as well. So, uh, excuse me, Stitches' core ability is hook, which lets him pull enemy targets from a long, long distance across the battleground into his team. And he can augment that ability to what we're calling a fishing hook, which significantly increases the range of that hook. So we'll see what that difference is. So the blue stitches has now upgraded that hook ability, and we can see just how much further that goes. So you can basically choose these different talents and customize your play style, and now it, uh, players from both forces now have to change up how they play to counter against this new ability. So next we're going to talk about Raynor, who is an iconic hero, and he's on the front of a box. He sweats a lot, he wears lip gloss, he's a leader of a Terran faction, the Raiders Raiders. He inspires his troop, and he has a whole arsenal behind him. These are some of the things that we brought to the table and knew we had to fulfill the fantasy on when we made him a hero in this game. I, I didn't know he had lip gloss. Anyway, look so, at the box. <laughs> so. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Raynor is just a Terran in a marine suit, and he has to fight against the Zerg and the Protoss all day. So we adapted his playstyle to what he actually would perform in the universe. So we wanted to give him a very safe uh, playstyle, not only for uh, playing up to that fantasy, but also for the beginners who are going to likely play Raynor for their very first hero. So let's watch Raynor in action. All right, so here we have Raynor actually pushing down into the lane. And he's going to use his signature ability, Penetrating Round, to knock back the enemies and deal a lot of damage. As you see, as Raynor is shooting at the enemy, he's actually utilizing his trait lead from the front. And what that does is, whenever an enemy that's recently damaged by Raynor dies, his abilities will recharge a little bit faster. This gives skilled players the ability to 
uh, distribute this trait so that they can use their abilities more often. So for even a simple hero like Raynor, there's still a lot of hidden strategy and gameplay for pros. Here we have Arthas and Illidan trying to gank Raynor, and he uses his penetrate around once and twice to keep himself safe. As Matt touched upon, you know, one of the cool things in Heroes of the Storm is the ability to choose your heroic ability. Now, similar to the idea of designing heroes, we want to make sure that uh, the heroic abilities not only fit a, some sort of fantasy, but are also very unique and have a very, very, uh, uh, very focused sort of reason for their playstyle. So here we have Raynor going into a lane, and he's actually going to summon, call in a favor from his buddy Matt Horner to call in his flagship battlecruiser, the Hyperion. The Hyperion actually will deal lots of AoE damage, and you can see here it's going to take out this fortification in no time flat. However, as you can see from that shadow there, it's not ideal for fighting enemy players because they could just, you know, step out of the shadow. On the flip side, Raynor can summon in a pair of Banshees, you know, and this gives Raynor the ability to duel with enemy heroes all of a sudden. He's, he becomes a very powerful duelist, so these Banshees will come in and start pew-pewing the enemy. So here we have Raynor, just doing, minding those, his own business. Arthur comes in and tries to kill him. But Raynor is able to call in these Banshees and knock him back with Penetrate around. Now the tables have turned on Arthas. Now you can see, as you can see here, the Banshees are actually flying units. So they can see into the shrubs that Arthas is trying to run away into, allowing Raynor and his Banshees to secure the kill. So let's take one more look at another hero. Here we have Tyrael, who's an angel, which is kind of like a ghost. And we have an affinity for those. Tyrael visually has a lot of things going for him that make him really, really easy to execute. He's wearing awesome armor, he has these cool angelic wings, but more than that, he's the angel of justice and he cares about the plight of man, and thematically, he's a very strong leader and ally. We'll explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, so Tyrael can be played in kind of two different ways. He can be the ultimate initiator for your team, or he can kind of use his abilities to protect his allies. So here we have Arthas engaging Nova, and if you haven't figured out by now, Arthas is kind of the bad guy in our videos. So normally this is not a fight that Nova wants to be in. She doesn't want to melee with Arthas, but Tyrael can use his Blessing of Sacrifice, and now all the damage dealt to Nova is being redirected to Tyrael. Now as Arthas tries to run away, Tyrael can use his Might of Eldrune to teleport to the location and secure the kill. In Heroes of the Storm, as we mentioned previously, you can customize your basic abilities. And something we really loved from Diablo 3 was the Fire Chains affix. So we wanted to let players use this. And when you customize your Hand of Sacrifice, it still remains the same great defensive ability. It still protects your allies. But we already had a cool art link between, between the ally that you were connected with. So we thought it would be cool if we could do something like Fire Chains. So see, we see here, he links with Uther, and now they can just run between all the minions and just melt them. And this creates a lot of good positional gameplay for both Tyrio and Uther, but also the enemies as they try to avoid this fire chain's damage. One of Tyrio's abil heroic abilities is Judgment, and this lets him be the ultimate initiator. He can charge in on an enemy, knocking them away and doing a lot of damage. So we're gonna look at like that in action. Um, again, Arthas, bad guy. <laughs> And he's going he's gonna to fight Nova, but he's a little bit smarter this time. He brought an allied Illidan with him. So this is a really bad situation for Nova to be in. She does not want to fight these two heroes. Tyrio can use Judgment to quickly rush in on Illidan, knocking both enemies away, and he kind of puts Illidan into a bad position. Illidan quickly goes down. He can use his Might of Eldrune to teleport on top of Arthas and continue the chase. It looks like Arthas is probably going to go down there. He did die. So we talked about some of our heroes individually, but when they come together, that's when they really shine. After all, this is a 5v5 team game, and one of the most fun ways to play is to grab a friend, come up with some strategies, try them out, and hopefully succeed. For example, in the shot, we have Tassadar walling off Illidan's escape, making it pretty easy for Stitches to land his hook and yank Illidan away from the security of his defenses. Now you can imagine if you and your friends wanted to try out a strategy like this, you go to select your hero and, and someone ste steals Stitches or Tassadar, that'd be really frustrating. So one of the things that we want to do is create this mode and where you and your party can reserve your heroes before you go into the game. That way you're guaranteed to play the way that you want to. Glad you like that. <laughs> 
Yeah, we're just trying to streamline a lot of things and get you into the game as fast as we can. So we think playing in a team is so important that we're actually going to reward you when you do it. And by, to do that, we're going to add a leveling system outside the game. And when you party up, you'll earn more experience and level up faster. And some of the rewards you'll get are the talents that you know, Matt and Rich were talking about earlier. And these talents, they're not about power. You're not going to just automatically want to use the latest talent you unlocked. These talents are more about options, options that fit your play style or fit that situation you just find yourself in. And you're going to be able to unlock some other cool stuff, like uh, new modes or access to some of our more advanced heroes, like Abathur, and uh, other cool aesthetic stuff, like skins and mounts. Yeah, so the mounts are this uh, cool cosmetic thing we added to heroes, but it also has a lot of gameplay. Players can ride their mounts into combat, and they can move around the map faster. And as the game progresses and you level up, your mount actually gets a little bit faster. So players can all, they can use a mount to kind of customize their look of their hero beyond just a skin. This is an awesome Terran mount that I love. I like this one. And this one is mine. So let's move on to skins. So as you can see here, we're having a ton of fun making skins. We have so many ideas, we can't stop thinking about them. And up here are a few examples of the skins that we are currently implementing or planning on doing. As you can see, on the top row with Uther, we have things like the pirate costume, or maybe he's part of a different faction. Maybe he's a blood sail buccaneer, just like the Nova right there that's infested. Maybe they took a different turn in their lore. Or we can send them to different universes, like the Uther that's in medic armor in the middle, or the Nova Amazon in the bottom page. There's a ton of possibilities. There's a ton of creative freedom. And like I said, that's what we really, really love about working on Heroes. So to kind of round it all up, we're going to show you a reel of a bunch of stuff that's coming down the pipe. It's all in alphabetical order. Here it goes. So while the video plays, if you guys want to line up for some questions, we'll be happy to take them. And uh, after the questions are done, please stick around. We have our, a live match. You'll be able to cheer on uh, Matt and Koo and some of the other designers as they play. And uh, we have our own Dustin the Rock Browder commentating as well, so you don't want to miss it. That's my favorite.
Let's do this. <laughs> I can't see. All right, my question is, uh, are we going to have, like, skins or anything from as far back as the Lost Vikings or mounts from rock and roll racers? I can't hear too well, but were you asking if we're going to have rock and roll racing and Lost Vikings characters? Yeah, mounts and, or skins. Yes, we are. It's going to happen. Can I get a skin? Can Deadpool get a skin? What's that? Can Deadpool get a skin? I can't hear. Thank you very much. Sorry, could you? Oh, thanks, Roger. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you happened to mention Goblin Merchants as an idea, but you didn't elaborate on that. And I wanted to know what ideas you have for items and perhaps a gold system. Well, the Goblin Merchant used to be something that we had on every map when items were still around. But as the design guys are going to explain, the item system isn't necessarily there, so we don't need the Goblin Merchant anymore. But he can talk to the item side of it. So we actually have swapped out the item system for the talent system that you see in game. You know, at the end of the day, you have to figure out like what's right for the game. And we swapped out the, the idea of farming gold and going back to base and getting your item didn't really match up with like sort of the fast paced games that we were trying to go for and making a lot of battlefield decisions. And uh, so that's why we have our talents and that's why you can choose them out in the field. And we think that there's a lot of customization options within the talents themselves. It's like every hero has their own item shop, essentially. I noticed a lot of fantasy-oriented stages in the demos, and I'm wondering if there's going to be any added that would be more along the lines of stuff that would be in tune with the StarCraft angle. So right now, the first thing we wanted to do was to bring you something new, but of course we're always expanding, and Warcraft, Diablo, and StarCraft are all on the menu for new battlegrounds. Hi, uh, I'm an avid MOBA player, and uh, most of the bigger MOBA games out there have incorporated in um, a Midwars type map variant. And I was wondering if we can expect to see any kind of map variant for Midwars with Heroes of the Storm. All right, so um, the focus right now is just trying to make the core experience really fun first. Um, but, I, but as you know, like the Heroes of the Storm was created with the engine that we made StarCraft II, and a lot, one of the things that's really awesome about it is that we can create these kind of modes and test them out in no time flat. I think that we created like an AB style capture point system just for experimentation. I think uh, like one of our, uh, our lead uh, tech designers, Meng Song, he created that mode in like two days, and we were able to iterate and just play test it within. So if we think about all the modes that you've seen back in Warcraft 3, um, like we can create all those, and if they're really fun and the community wants it, we can certainly ship them. Hi. At the last panel for this game, uh, they mentioned that one of your guys' design goals was to get min uh, games down to 20 minutes. And when I first heard it, that sounded like a rather lofty goal, but you guys have played a lot more of this game than the two games that I've gotten to play on the show floor so far. Um, what kind of design choices have you guys made to make sure that the game only manages 20 minutes? And uh, how committed are you guys to that goal? Uh, <laughs> sorry. We are very committed to that goal. We think that having 15 to 20 minute games is a sweet spot for us because then you get into that zone where you can play more games during lunch. And then you get into like, when you're playing like Hearthstone, those games are really fast and you get into like, oh man, if I could just play one more game, one more game, one more game. So we are really committed to that. As far as like really pushing the pace, you know, we have a lot of balance tools on, um, on our side. We can make the map mechanics that you want to secure a little bit stronger. So, to, so like a lot of the power in pushing the lanes comes from the map mechanics themselves. So you saw the uh, Grave Golem on, uh, on the Haunted Mines, and he just like destroys the lane. We can always just make him a little bit stronger. Or like when you think about the dragon that you can turn into in Dragonshire, like he's really, really powerful. Why don't we just give him like 20, twice as much HP? So it really sort of pushes the issue with the, with the team, with the time. Um, the timer that you see at BlizzCon is just for BlizzCon. We want the games to end organically, so we're not going to be using that to force the games to end at 25 minutes, though. Perfect. And something where players level up a lot faster in Heroes of the Storm, uh, you don't have to spend as much time in lane. And because there's, there's team XP, you can actually have players moving around the battleground while they keep a couple players in the lane. So it kind of just speeds up the pace of the whole game.
I had a question about Avatar's ultimate final evolution. I'm curious how you see it fitting into the rest of his kit and why it seems like that's his only choice for an ultimate. Um, so, the reason why we uh, ch the reason why Abathur only has one heroic ability right now is because we thought that like for BlizzCon, being able to control any other hero on the battlefield and being able to use their heroic abilities was enough to sort of show like how committed we are to making them sort of like a really team player. You can imagine like when really skilled players are coordinating their teams, they're going to think, so if we have two Kerrigans, we can actually double up on summon Ultralist, and then we can just like bash the team in. Um, we actually do have designs for uh, Abathur for his second heroic ability, but we just haven't implemented it yet. So we do have plans for more. Uh, and how, how, does, how does his current ability fit more into like, the kit and the other abilities that he has? Like, where's the synergy there? Yeah, so the, the way that Abathur's ultimate evolution fits into his kit is like, so normally he's just infesting people and he's like sort of supporting them using like his uh, little shield and he's stabbing people, but the ultimate evolution allows him to create a clone of it. And the power level is just so much higher than all of his other abilities, so that's just how it fits in. I, I don't know if you notice that when you actually use ultimate evolution, Abathur disappears from the map. So when he actually turns into that clone, and the clone dies, Abathur does not die. He actually just reappears from where he was before. He's actually pretty much invulnerable when he uses that ability. So it kind of gives him the ability to sort of like be the hero himself. Thank you. Cool. Hey. Uh, all right. First of all, thank you for making like an awesome game. I've had a lot of fun playing it. Uh, second of all, you've incorporated a lot of the awesome heroes that all the universes have, like Arthas, so on and so forth. Also the Barbarian from uh, Diablo 3, which isn't like a hero per se, but something that players play. How about units like the Hydralisk or all of the other units that are in the Warcraft and Starcraft universe, which does not have like a big hero per se, but is a very loved unit? We do have plans for stuff like that. Um, we have characters that are just characters that are appealing to us, like the Warcraft 3 Necromancer, and it's like, well, we could call it Kel'Thuzad, and there's tons of stuff we're exploring like that. Obviously, Kel'Thuzad is also a lich, but we definitely key in on those things, and we've talked about dryads and all sorts of other stuff, and we'll put them where they feel appropriate as long as the design guys have a role for them. We work very tightly on that stuff. Yeah, and uh, Siege Tank's one of our favorite characters from you know, the StarCraft universe, so we actually, in our internal builds, we have a Siege Tank hero. Hi, you mentioned that you would have like an account level where you could unlock additional heroes or talents. Will you be able to pay money to unlock those? And do you guys have a general opinion on pay to win mechanics? So we have the out of game progression system and um, there's actually two components of it. One of it is that player level and yes, you will be able to unlock um, some, some talents and some uh, uh, the ability to purchase some heroes. Uh, we also have the gold system, so you, when you play, you'll earn gold as well, and you'll be able to sp spend that gold to purchase heroes, talents. Um, you won't be able to buy like uh, power with real money necessarily. It's not like uh, if you you know you give us twenty bucks and obviously you're going to win every single game. Um, you, you you get the power, you get the options through playing the game and progressing in your player level. And uh, some of the skins, the aesthetics, uh, those will be, um, you know, you, you purchase them with real money, and some of those you have to unlock through, through the progression system as well. Hi. Uh, so I had a lot of fun uh, seeing Diablo play uh, with his Flame Blast ability. Now, I know you were talking a lot about having their iconic abilities and as anyone who's played Diablo 2 and died many, many times to Diablo will attest, his Flame Blast is actually more of a lightning attack. I don't know if you were planning to change that or make it a different skin or anything like that. We, we get this feedback a lot, and the important thing to key in on is we are still iterating a ton, and we pass those comments back and forth all the time of like, you know, maybe this character should do this a little bit more, or can we change this visual? But since we're still iterating and testing a lot, like we are by no means done. And those visuals could change any time. And we're definitely thinking about it. We see the same stuff you see. And thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> hey, guys. Oh. <laughs> um, I played Stitches, and I played Kerrigan, and I had a whole lot of fun. 
but I noticed you guys touched on how easy it was for you to make new maps. I was wondering if that decision sort of factored into deciding not to go with the classic A and of Strife map, or like what led to the decision to just absolutely not go with that map. So um, we feel that having multiple battlegrounds with uh, different mechanics that change the way that you play is actually a key feature for us. Um, pushing like just all right into the middle and ignoring the map mechanics is certainly a viable strategy. But like when you think about like playing this game and comparing it to others, we've changed so much. So I think you're, you know players are going to have to get used to the uh, battlegrounds themselves. Yeah, in, in, internally we played a lot of different maps, and the ones with the map objectives really are the ones that we had the most fun playing. Uh, if players, if you, if you happen not to like that type of map, we do have a great engine that you know that, that you can. Uh, create to create your own maps. So if you if you don't want a map with map objectives, use the editor. You'll oh, you don't have to be able to do the ship necessarily. We're, we we do want to allow you to do it at some point, but you can create a map without any map object objectives and just have something you're more used to. Hey guys, uh, thank you first of all for the panel. I really appreciate it, uh, and I think. I may speak for a lot of people when I say that I appreciate that you're uh, sort of cutting out the middleman between gold and items and, you know, essentially instead of farming, going to the shop, buying the item to either make yourself tankier or a damage dealer or whatever, that that just lives in a talent. Uh, I think that's really cool. I think it's a really great direction for the game. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I actually have two questions. The first one is about your content strategy for once the game comes out. So, uh, you know, if you look at a game like League of Legends or most of the other MOBAs, uh, it's, it's hero-driven. And since you have such a pantheon of, of characters, obviously you want to pick the best ones and you don't kind of want to be scraping the bottom of the barrel three years from now. So uh, I guess my question is, is this going to be more map-focused or hero-driven? Like, what kind of content can we see coming out a year or two years after the game is shipped? So what we have on the floor today, we have four battlegrounds, and those are just the ones we're working with. We're waiting actually for feedback from everybody to see which battlegrounds work. Is four too many? You know, like what kind of things can we do to improve that experience? So similar to say like StarCraft II, and we are rotating maps in and out of that pool constantly, we'll be doing the same thing. You know, we have a really powerful tool. We can make maps on the fly. We can create new ones. We can see Blackheart's Bay in a different variation. We can see Dragonshire where there's maybe two dragons. You know, all that stuff is available to us. To answer your uh, previous question about the, the content strategy, um, it's a little bit too early to tell, but if you look at how Blizzard has supported games in the past, like you know, like WoW, um, you know, there's a lot of content, it's regularly released, and we do have plans to create more heroes and battlegrounds, skins, mounts, talents, all that good stuff. Can I do my second question? Uh, then the second question, it, it's admittedly a bit nerdier. Uh, <laughs> sure, go, go for it. So uh, one of the big hallmarks of sort of competitive play is being able to discern what your enemies have up their sleeve. Uh, so if you look at their list of items, you can say, whoa, that guy's building tanky, that guy has more damage, etc." cetera. Uh, so with the talent system, in the example you gave about Stitches and his longer range hook talent versus a shorter range hook, Will I, as the enemy, be able to tell what he has up his sleeve before he uses it so that I can know how to react on the battlefield? Of course. Um, so this is uh, you know, only an alpha version of the game. We actually don't have the, all the UI elements in. You know, it all sort of came in really hot at the last moment. But uh, we actually have plans for a new feature called the strategic map, which actually takes the mini map and kind of zooms it out a little bit more. And so you can see, you get a lot more information. And there we can uh, add a lot of information for each of the enemy heroes, what kind of towns they've chosen, et cetera, et cetera. OK, cool. thank, thank you. you. Uh, we're actually out of time for questions, guys. Uh, we're going to be doing a show match on stage shortly, so stick around. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for attending the Heroes of the Storm deep dive panel. Up next, Heroes of the Storm live matches.